Welcome back. This is another questions and answers sessions about public health and global health. And I'm going to start off by answering some of the questions that have already been asked on my YouTube channel in the comments. I'm going to address those first. The first question comes from Alexander Smith. And this question, it's, quite, it's a good question. What are the key challenges and opportunities in public health today? The answer to this really is focused on two types of people. The one is you've just recently finished studying public health, you did an MPH or something like that, maybe you've done a PhD, and you're thinking about where do I go from here, where do I lean into, what should I be focused on so that my career has got legs, right, so that I'm doing something that will still be relevant 10, 15, 20 years from now. And the other kind of person that should be interested in this is you're starting to study public health, right? You've, you, you're, and at this time of the year, that'll be a lot of you. You're starting an MPH. Uh, you're going to be exposed to all sorts of different things. What should you focus on? Where do you want to really pay close attention? Where's the future of public health going to be? And there's a couple of things that jump off the page, and I'll tell you what I think they are. This isn't a comprehensive list, but this is just where I think if, if I were studying public health today, if I was doing an MPH, right now, this is what I would be focused on. The one thing that we have to acknowledge up front is that there's been a huge shift from communicable to non-communicable disease, right? And with that shift, there's gotta be a shift in focus and emphasis, right? So we're gonna talk about cardiovascular diseases and cancer, et cetera, et cetera, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndromes, et cetera. There's gonna be a huge emphasis on preventing those disease and helping people with those diseases live healthy lives, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, Certainly anybody that's interested in what the future looks like, that's going to be increasingly the case. Having said that, okay, built into our thinking must be that, firstly, is this ongoing risk of pandemic, you know, ongoing pandemic risk, right? So pandemic preparedness is going to be extremely important in the years to come. Something, and, and there's a little bit of an unknown there, right? Is there going to be another pandemic in the near future or not? Are we going to wait another 100 years? Nobody knows, but certainly things like avian influenza are on our minds, we're thinking about it, we are seeing changes to the biology of, the, of, of some of the viruses that are floating around, and it's going, pandemic preparedness is certainly going to be an important area without question in years to come. Something where there's not really a question mark, it's certainly going to be the case that antimicrobial resistance is going, is going to be one of the biggest challenges facing us in the medical and public health space. Antimicrobial resistance, or AMR, is likely to contribute to about 50 million deaths a year by the year 2050. We're very unfortunately kind of stumbling into this post-antibiotic era, and there, is, there are things that we can do, but we have to be proactive. It's going to be a huge space for public health to step into. The other obvious one, of course, is climate change and health, and I've got videos out there on climate change and the impact on health and what it is we need to do to be more resilient in the face of climate change. I mean, obviously, on the one hand, we need to try and prevent and mitigate climate change itself as much as possible, but then if we accept that it is a reality, climate change is happening, there will be consequences in terms of where people live and where diseases spread, we need to do things to make sure that our health systems are resilient. Okay, so climate change and health is gonna be a big area, definitely make some time to focus on that. Next, digital health and innovation, and in particular, the application of AI in health systems. There is so much happening in the space, uh, you really have to pay attention to keep up. There is a need for people that are in public health to have a deep technical understanding of how AI is unfolding and what the implications and opportunities there within are. If you are that way inclined, definitely focus on it. There's gonna be so many opportunities. AI and health is very exciting, so you know, watch that space. Urban health and planning, going to be big, definitely learn about that. Then there's also the usual things, and I'm going to mention them because they haven't gone away. Things like inequity and inequality and healthcare, definitely be thinking about hard to reach populations. That's not going to go away. That's going to continue to be important. Health system strengthening, that's not going to go away. It's going to continue to be important. You cannot go wrong by getting a good skill set in that space. It's useful across the board, no matter what you land up doing. If you've got a good understanding of health system strengthening, you will add value 100%. And then lastly, of course, universal health coverage. Of course, this isn't new. I've got videos on that. If you don't know what it is, look at those videos. Universal health coverage is going to continue to be important. It isn't just a one simple thing that you switch on. It has to be worked toward. It's complicated. It needs people that understand it. If you want to really understand something that will absolutely have relevance in decades to come, universal health coverage is going to be one of those. There will be jobs available for people that know and understand the application of universal health coverage in different settings. So, you know, absolutely spend time, learn about that, can't go wrong, thumbs up. The next question comes from Emily Thompson. Thanks for this question, Emily. And the question is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic reshaped the global health landscape? Great question, Emily. And I think why it's important that we take stock of this 
is that it impacts on where it is that we as public health professionals need to lean in and where it is that we can add value. What is our sort of value proposition in this very quickly changing landscape? Now, the one thing I will say is that some of the changes because of COVID-19 are, are perfectly obvious. We, there is an emphasis now on pandemic preparedness that simply didn't exist before, certainly not at the scale. Um, we've always known that a pandemic could and would happen at some point in time. And of course, now it has has happened. And, and, and of course, it will happen again in the future. And we're not entirely sure when that'll be. But it's again an inevitability, an inevitability, and we need to prepare for it now. What are the things that we're doing a little bit differently now? Uh, we, we're probably thinking about a broader spectrum of pathogens that we need to get ready for. There's, I think, a stronger emphasis on health systems strengthening and health systems resilience. Um, we're thinking more about what needs to be in place in a health system when masses of, of existing healthcare resources get diverted to responding to the needs of a pandemic. In other words, we need to be able to ensure that people with other health needs continue to have those health needs met. And just so that you know, this channel is sponsored by Nested Knowledge. That's a platform that supports systematic literature review and meta-analysis. They're absolutely amazing. Check out the link in the description below. And with that, on with the lesson. We certainly found that in, during COVID-19, there were people that, for example, didn't get uh, diagnosed as early as they might have with other diseases. And th there's a huge knock-on effect because of that, because health systems and health services and acute hospitals were under so much strain during the height of the pandemic. So these are things that we really need to think through a little bit more carefully and get right going forwards. Um, certainly in terms of pandemic preparedness, another area that we're thinking about a lot is how it is that we work with other countries, um, how it is that we do surveillance in a way that multiple countries are speaking to each other, that we're seeing uh, the outputs of whole genome sequencing from one country to the next in real time as, in as much as possible. That's really important. How it is that we engage with the international health regulations, the IHR. We've always done that, but I think we're leaning into that a little bit more closely now because of the importance of it. We're recognizing the importance of it. Um, so there's quite a few things in terms of the international sort of uh, and, and the cross-border uh, threats that we think about in, in a little bit more detail now than we may have in the past, or the emphasis is, is, is certainly has certainly changed. The other thing that's new following COVID-19 is now the rapid development of RNA vaccines. I mean, we can do this very quickly now, and I think that's a huge thing that we've got now that we didn't have in the past. And we can start thinking about what needs to be in place in order to have a vaccine ready to use within 100 days of a serious uh, pandemic or serious outbreak. And then there are lots of people working like working very hard to ensure that that sort of capability is in place. So that's very exciting. The other thing that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic was, was really the rise of telehealth uh, and, and video conferencing. And I think that, that had a huge impact on our ability to provide services to people um, under, under circumstances under which that may have otherwise been very difficult. So telehealth has become a big thing and I think it'll continue to grow. I think people are now used to it and that means it'll just become part of normal business as usual. And finally, I think that as public health professionals, we've grown to understand that the solution to some of our problems are extremely practical. In other words, when we talk about diagnostics and we talk about treatments, a lot of what we need to lean into is really understanding the logistics of it. How do things get into a country? Where do they get stored? Where did, how do they get distributed? How do they get used? How do we distribute information about how to use them? How do we get information from a testing center into a data lake that can be accessed by a clinician who can make a clinical or public health decision in real time. All of these are extremely practical problems that have to be solved. And we need to realize that as public health professionals, we, we need to have a detailed knowledge of, of each of these steps. Now, not every single one of us can have a detailed knowledge of every single step, but we need to accept the fact that this is a whole area of work that we've got to lean into. It might be that any one of us uh, may have deep skills and understanding of a small part of the bigger picture, but it's something that we cannot ignore. And that is that there is a, a, an agile management, a, a getting things done uh, component to public health that becomes increasingly important in the context of an emergency, in the context of something that has to be done urgently. Um, when there's an emergency, when there's a pandemic, the time for kind of stepping back and writing academic papers and you know uh, pontificating about what should or shouldn't happen is gone. It's about rolling up your sleeves and getting stuff done, getting it done quickly, working with all sorts of stakeholders and uh, working with technology, working with the private sector where needs be, uh, working with government, working with other sectors, working with public health, working with clinicians, and doing it all very fast in an agile management kind of way. 
And finally, and I'm going to make this the last question for today because I want to keep these sessions relatively short. Uh, Brian Johnson asks, which countries and regions are at the forefront of public health innovation? And I think it's a lovely question because we want to be looking around at what other countries are doing and say, what can we learn? Okay, where is their best practice? Where is there something that's being done that's a little bit different, that's a bit, maybe a little bit eccentric, but obviously good and productive uh, and impactful? And can we adopt those uh, those the, you know those things in our own country? So I think that, that it's, a, it's a lovely question to ask. One that we should always be asking. Okay, a few come to mind, and obviously there's a long list. There's many countries that are doing interesting things, but I will just sort of say, let's just put a couple of them on the table and maybe we revisit this question again and again and again. But the ones that come to mind, Scandinavian countries are doing fantastic work in the in, in the in the in the area of preventative care. Uh, we all need to do better there, right? Because if you can prevent illness, firstly, that's a person you know who now isn't sick. So you know, high five, thumbs up, well done. But you're also taking a lot of pressure off the acute hospital systems and the healthcare system, which can then reorient itself and focus its energy and resources on the people that are sick and that do need care. So when you prevent illness in one person, you actually increase the level of care that's available to another person. So pre prevent prevention, you know, it's always oh, prevention is better than cure. It's a lot better than cure. All right. So like let's, and there's huge money to be saved. Those resources as, as you know, can be re-diverted. Uh, so preventative work. And incidentally, it shouldn't be this difficult. I mean, we should, I, like, I don't understand why it's taking us so long to catch up with uh, countries like the Scandinavian countries in terms of making this a priority. Um, anyway, but nevertheless, Scandinavian countries doing phenomenally well in that space. Uh, Singapore, in terms of the application of new technologies, doing amazingly. I think there's a lot to learn from them. And we, we should all be saying, are there technologies that we can apply in the public health space and in the healthcare, in, in healthcare space better? And do we need to be so slow in adopting these things? It, it really is kind of quite startling how slow it is that we can be to adopt new technology uh, when, when, when you know, the applications, in my mind, are absolutely obvious. Um, African nations have done remarkably well in terms of identifying opportunities for cost savings. And often that's been out, out of necessity, right? So you, you, you may be a country that has, doesn't have as many resources as another country, but you still want to be able to provide ex exceptional care and treatment and good public health services. And you find in many African nations, there's a lot of very innovative ways of really focusing down on how to provide cost-effective healthcare um, in, in, in all sorts of low resource settings. Uh, and maybe I'll make a whole video about that at some point in time. Um, a, a, a good friend of mine, actually, I've got the book right here. Ah, I didn't think I'd talk about this, but here it is, uh, Decolonizing Healthcare Innovation. This is a good friend of mine, um, Matthew Harris. He writes and talks a lot about this idea of reverse, reverse innovation. What it is that high income in industrialized countries can learn from poorer countries. Uh, and there's a lot. And I, I, re I recommend the book. So, you know, buy that and read it. Shout out to Matthew. And finally, I just want to talk about countries that did very well with respect to pandemic response during the pandemic. The two countries I want to talk about are New Zealand and, and Ireland. And I, I'll talk about Ireland because I'm in Ireland and I know and understand what happened here. And New Zealand was faced with very similar challenges and they did exceptionally well. Now, obviously, there's a lot of looking back and retrospective and which countries did what and what was effective and what was the best strategy, et cetera, et cetera. It's very difficult to compare one country to the next because each country is faced with their own set of internal challenges. Let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. I, both Ireland and New Zealand have very few ICU beds per capita relative to other similar countries. Okay, so both Ireland and New Zealand, extremely low numbers of ICU beds. And so the response that, that New Zealand and Ireland needed to have was necessarily different from countries like the UK, for example. Uh, and, you know, because we had, they, they, the UK had certainly many more ICU beds, that's intensive care unit beds per capita. Okay, and so they could afford to have more COVID-19 floating around and they had more capacity to absorb additional sick people. That wasn't the case in Ireland and New Zealand. The Ireland and New Zealand really stand out as countries with very, very few ICU beds per capita. And because of that, there was an enormous, there was enormous pressure on the two countries to control community spread of COVID-19. 
And I think both countries did a really good job in different ways, that adopted different strategies, but both countries did exceptional jobs in terms of uh, good evidence-based policies, firstly. And secondly, uh, in both countries, there was enormous an enormous response from the population, people being compliant with, with policy advice and guidelines. Um, Ireland at one point had the highest number of, uh, you know, the highest number of vaccinated people, you know, the highest proportion of the population fully vaccinated, with the exception of a few very, very small countries where, you know, there's eight people and all eight of them got the vaccine. Fair enough. But if you compare Ireland to other similar sort of industrialized countries, uh, they did exceptionally well in that space and in other spaces. So very proud of what we did in Ireland. I think, it, that, you know, and I'm, I'm not blowing my own uh, horn here. I'm talking about my colleagues and other people that did an exceptional job here. And I know what, what happened in New Zealand was phenomenal. Many other countries did remarkable work. And, you know, this is not to, to say that that wasn't the case. I'm just very conscious of how similar Ireland and New Zealand were in terms of the challenges in front of them and what they needed to do to, to manage down the risks associated with ICU beds filling up because there's a huge knock-on effect. People that are ill for other reasons outside of COVID-19, if your ICU beds fill up, will just not get the care and treatment they need. Um, so it, it becomes an important challenge. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about uh, the pandemic story. Thank you very much for watching this Q&A session. Uh, send more questions to me. Just put questions in the comments below any of my videos and I'll try and pick them up and put them into these Q&A sessions. Great to see you. Take care. Don't do drugs. Don't ever change. Always do your best. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.